The burger chain Fodruck has changed its name to Buffruck. <laughs> While he may well be the world's worst archaeologist, only losing out to Enchantress from Suicide Squad. <laughs> no idea who that is. Kevin wrote this. He's like, yeah, yeah, Enchantress, Suicide All I heard about the Suicide Squad movie is that it was a bit I don't even- is it like in the Marvel Universe? Is it DC? Is it not related to comics at all? I don't even know. I've never seen it and I never will. Indiana Jones was undeniably cool. If you're wondering what the f**k's going on and you're new here, uh, Kevin's written me a script. I've never read it before. When I was growing up, all the kids loved Indy, including his 15-year-old student, Marion Ravenwood. But it's not actually the movies that I want to talk about. It's the often-forgotten TV show that was spun off from these movies. What? There was? I... Da, 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 da. Man, thank there are only 28 episodes split across two seasons, but when I was nine years old, ABC began airing The Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. You know, I have to say, this is ringing very, very vague bells in my mind. Is this a cartoon? I absolutely love the show as a kid, though I've never gone back and rewatched it. Yeah, I mean, there were shows that I loved when I was a kid, but I've never gone back and rewatched because I was a kid and now I'm an adult and I'm sure they're, they, they're, they're just not going to appeal to my adult self. Also, even shows that I liked in the 90s that I've rewatched and I've like, the, the worst ones, <laughs> I've often said to my wife, I say, yeah, 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 we must rewatch this show. It's called Sliders. Or another one was, it's called The Outer Limits. It's amazing. It was like one of the best shows on TV when I was a kid. And then you watch it and you're like, oh yeah, no, TV got really good. Because now, like Sliders was amazing for the 90s, but now it's got to compete with shit like Breaking Bad. And you're like, each episode's like a movie. And Sliders is like 16, uh, what was before 16 by 9? The box format? All of this, and it's like, no, it just doesn't compete to my wife's like, it's a bit shit, isn't it? I'm like, yeah, it is a bit shit, isn't it? <laughs> My assumption was that it probably doesn't hold up, but it has a 7.2 on IMDb and 86 audience score on Rotten Tomatoes. 7.2 on IMDb is like, meh, I don't know, everything on IMDb is between like 6 and 8, isn't it? Uh, but on Rotten Tomatoes, that's a good score. So maybe it really was as good as I remember it being. I'd already started playing the cello before the show aired because in my town, we got the chance to play string instruments in elementary school and then in middle school, we could learn winds and percussion. Really? <laughs> okay, that's, thanks, thanks for that, Kevin. Fascinating. Making music was a lot of fun and I was really good at it, so I certainly wasn't going to turn down an opportunity to learn another instrument. And as of March the 13th, 1993, I knew exactly what instrument I wanted to play. Kevin, what are we talking about? <laughs> Why have we suddenly... Does the did Indiana Jones play the cello? Did I miss something? Just before we continue, let me tell you about our wonderful sponsor today. That's absolutely all-time favorite Squarespace. Look, if you ever struggle to stand out online, well, fear not. That's where Squarespace comes in. Squarespace allows you to build a stunning online presence incredibly easily. What they have is there's something called the flexible website templates, which is sort of like a closet full of stylish website templates. You just go in there, you grab one, you tweak it, you do a little work, you drag and drop using something called Fluid Engine, and boom, you're done. I built my website in less than an afternoon. I've said this many times, and it's just become easier as Squarespace have developed with the Fluid Engine. It's just easier than ever before and it looks good i have no web design skills i have no design skills and i just put together a website that looks great and it's incredibly affordable and why wouldn't you basically plus they have also have a new feature called courses where you can sell an online course it's right there in the name isn't it seamlessly professional layouts you use fluid engine to edit and you turn your knowledge into income just like that. So are you ready to transform your online presence? Well, you should be. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash blaze and you'll save 10% of your first purchase of a website or a domain using the code blaze. So don't settle for the ordinary. Be extraordinary with Squarespace. And now back to today's video. That was the night that season two, episode five of the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles aired, which was the only episode in the entire show to guest star Harrison Ford. The episode, titled Young Indiana Jones and the Mystery of the Blues, opened in the 1950s with Harrison Ford discovering his old saxophone in a pile of junk. He began to play, and the episode then flashed to 1920s Chicago, where a young the indie defeated gangsters with the power of jazz. This way boy's crazy! What is this show about? I guess it's live action. Now, I don't remember it at all. But it doesn't really matter what the plot was. What mattered is that Indiana Jones was as cool as shit and he played the sax.
So that was the instrument that I was going to play. I don't think, I, I don't know, I was never a particularly musical person. I don't think I ever saw someone playing an instrument and was like, I want to be cool like that guy. I really, although now I'm thinking about it, it's like maybe there are bells ringing about me wanting to learn as a, I don't know. I don't, I, I like piano. Like I play a little piano and that's about it. And I like it. Uh, it's probably, it, it's definitely my favorite instrument to both play and listen to. Unfortunately for me, the instruments were chosen, I have to say, I bought something cool. <laughs> I bought a piano. <laughs> that plays itself like I had a I had like a um, One of those ones where you press the the pedals and it plays itself like I think you call them player pianos in America We call them pianolas in the UK and I bought like the modern equivalent of that So you have like uh, it you can it uses the computer in it, and you can just send it music and it plays it <laughs> It's amazing. So now I'm just like sitting having dinner or like just hanging around my house and there's a f off piano just playing music and I'm like, this is sick. Unfortunately for me, the instruments were chosen by students in alphabetical order. The saxes were all gone by the time they got to the J's, so I wound up playing clarinet on the basis that it was the closest thing to a saxophone. It took a couple more years before I was able to learn the sax as well, but I did finally get to it all. Kevin, humble brag, how many instruments do you play, Kevin? Multiple instruments. I play many. <laughs> I, I play the piano badly. And that is the power of product placement. This may not have been a paid promotion by Selmer or something like that. I guess they make saxophones. But principle is the same. People see characters, they like doing something on TV or in movies, and they want to do this same thing. Yeah, this is true. I'm, a, I'm sure I'm a sucker for this. There's tons of shit that I just got into because it's like you see cool people doing it on TV. Like smoking and drugs. But it could have just as easily been eating Taco Bell, wearing Old Navy clothes, or smoking Camel Unfiltered. They still make unfiltered cigarettes. Cigarettes. <laughs> really? I mean, I know that the fil does the filter even do anything, but I, I imagine like smoking unfiltered cigarettes is is worse for you than smoking filtered cigarettes. I I, I know that unfiltered cigarettes are a thing because I've been in countries where it's like they they're just shorter and they don't have the filter. And you're like, okay, <laughs> love cancer. What the hell you say? This is big business, and nearly $30 billion are spent on product placement every year. Of that, nearly $3 billion is spent for product placement in movies. Sometimes it works out great, like how E.T. boosted sales of Reese's Pieces. Most advertisements aren't even close to as effective as that one, but sometimes they're downright disastrous. Back to the Future Back to the Future is one of the greatest movies ever made full stop. King agree. I love that. Oh, I made something cool. Hold on. You want to talk about product placement? Check out this awesome Lego DeLorean that I made. It does this. It's got this thing underneath. How does this work? Yeah, you flip this. And the wheels turn around. It's freaking awesome. And you can like pop up the, the hood somehow. This is there. Oh, that came off. That's not supposed to come off. I'm going to... Oh, my model's falling apart. This can open somehow. Let's just leave that on there before I break it even more. Let's just leave this here. It looks cool. <laughs> However, the movie is also notorious for its heavy use of product placement. This was completely intentional because having recognizable brands would help create a sense of realism as Marty traveled backward in time. When Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale wrote the script, they were adamant on having Pepsi featured in the movie, not because they thought they could get a shitload of money out of the company, but because Pepsi had a different logo in 1955 than it did in 1985. This made it much more appealing than to them than Coke, whose packaging had remained virtually unchanged. It was a great deal for Pepsi as well, as their only cost for being promotionally featured in both the visuals and dialogue of the movie was to keep the set stocked with free Pepsi. That's kind of awesome. Hey, Coke. I don't have a Coke here today, but I often do. I'll, I'll keep doing it if you send me free Coke. I'm going to keep doing it anyway. But Coke, I love you. Come on. Come on. Get in it with your boy. Send me some free Coke. Cocaína. No. Flour. While the product placement throughout Back to the Future was done to help make the different settings in time feel realistic, it was not subtle. The movie opens with a shot of Doc Brown's house and his Rube Goldberg alarm clock system that made breakfast fed Einstein and for some reason turned on both the radio and the TV. Oh yeah, that was weird. The first movie, uh. the first audio in that movie, aside from dozens of ticking clocks, was a radio commercial for Toyota. 
October is inventory time, so right now, Statler Toyota is making the best deals of the year. After the camera finished showing off the crazy mechanical room, Marty opened the door. The movie featured a long shot of Marty's Nike shoes as he walked through the abandoned room, his skateboard banging against the box of stolen plutonium that was just mentioned on the TV's morning news. It's about 30 seconds straight of just Marty's Nikes exploring the room, and this was going to be a pretty sweet deal for Nike. Or Nike if you're American and you want to pronounce it properly. Fine. Do I have to address this in every video? Because otherwise everyone in the comments is going to be like... <laughs> Did you mean Nike, Simon? Did you mean Nike? We say it Nike in the UK. I don't know why. I'm sorry, but I can't win. If I pronounce it Nike, every British person is going to be like, stop pandering to the Americans. If I pronounce it Nike, every American's going to be upset. I mean, the majority of the audience are American. By far. Like, UK's like this compared to the Americans. F yeah! So maybe I should just pronounce it Nike and embrace that, but also not. Originally, Eric Stolls was cast to play Marty McFly, but he was replaced with Michael J. Fox. When Fox showed up on set, he happened to be wearing his personal pair of Nikes. The wardrobe department didn't actually have shoes for him, so Zemeckis told Fox just to wear the ones he had on. But he also immediately realized that the shoes Fox happened to own could be a problem. The high-top sneakers Fox was wearing happened to be a discontinued style. Zemeckis called up, no way, Nike are going to re-release this, aren't they? That's... Jesus, that is such a big brain idea. It's also just the power of this Robert Zemeckis dude being like, yo, Nike, we need you to re- or, or Nike, you want to make some money? Like, free money. Just do these again because they're going to be in our movie. And they offered to produce 12 more pairs of the shoes that Fox could use during filming. As far as I, like, oh, wait, Nike, I feel like you missed a trick. Illusion, Michael. Mm. Trick is something a whore does for money. As far as I can tell, this was the only thing Nike had to do to pay to be in the movie. And both they and Pepsi saw a huge boost in sales after being prominently featured in objectively one of the best movies of all time. However, not everybody got quite as sweet a deal as they did. There are plenty of other brands that you might remember from the movie, like the old-timey Texaco station of 1955 stocked full of Wrigley's gum, or Calvin Klein underwear, which was turned into a major plot point of the film. Well, that is your name, isn't it? Calvin Klein? It's written all over your underwear. It was? Oh, I vaguely remember this. I vaguely remember this. Oh, isn't his name in the in the third one? He's like Calvin Klein. Something like that. Oh my god, it was full of product placement. I wasn't I didn't even notice. But one product you probably don't remember was raisins. The Californian Raisin Board paid Universal Studios $25,000 to have raisins featured in the movie. They were supposed to appear in two scenes, including a scene of Marty eating raisins. This was a year before the California Raisins became their own animated sensation. This must be an American thing. I don't know about this. <laughs> raisins becoming an animated sensation. Americans, what's up? And California farmers were desperate to find a way to attract customers to their massive surplus of grapes and raisins. Unfortunately for the board, that scene of Marty eating raisins never appeared in the movie. Bob Gale said that on film it would have looked like Marty eating a bowl full of dirt. Instead, there is only one reference to raisins in the entire film. I have to say though, 25 grand, even in like 1980s money, which is what, 100 grand a day, maybe something like that, seems like a pretty good deal to be in back to the future and i guess it wasn't like as fate the doors on this thing also go up how cool is this isn't this awesome and it's got this little mr fusion on the back I i'm getting distracted by how cool this is it seems like a good deal to get your product featured in a movie when marty returns to 1985 from the past he went back to the future if you will he arrived next to a bench where a homeless man was sleeping behind the body of the homeless man the bench had been painted with an ad for california raisins wow that's not the sort of product placement you want is it it's kind of like yeah yeah it's the bench where a homeless man was sleeping i think product placement in uk movies and tv is actually not allowed which doesn't really make sense when I think about it, because like James Bond, Aston Martins, all of that kind of stuff. But I think there's different rules. That's not quite the same level of promotion as the movie's main character wearing your sneakers for the entire film. There were threats of a lawsuit, but Universal gave the California Raisin Board their money back, and that seemed to be the end of it. Idiocracy. Based on, oh no, wait. So, what's that famous line is like, uh, makes plants grow? Was Is it Gatorade or something? Uh, Gatorade, it makes plants grow! I, you know, President Comancho or whatever. That's not a good look. Not everybody deserves happiness. Did they pay for that? 
Based on all the interviews that have been given, Idiocracy was a movie that was doomed to failure from the start. It was, isn't it super successful? It's like, it's awesome. Fox already had a working relationship with Mike Judge through both King of the Hill and Office Space. I've seen King of the Hill. That's my purse! I don't know you! <laughs> Not like it's great haven't seen all of it office space is a banger of a movie one of my favorites however this relationship was more than a little strained by the point that idiocracy was pitched despite office space performing poorly at the box office it eventually made fox a load of money in dvd sales and they decided they wanted to try again judge pitched four different ideas and fox decided to go with the project originally titled 3001 which was later changed to idiocracy however this put both fox and judge in a difficult position since neither of them had actually wanted to work with the other one anymore. Fox didn't actually want to make Idiocracy, but they also didn't want to turn it down and let somebody else make it either. Instead, they greenlit the movie and only gave Judge a budget of $2.4 million. That said, as long as you ignore the rather pro-eugenics messaging of the premise and attribute society's decline to other things, it's a really funny movie. Yeah, it is kind of like pro- but that's not how it works, right? Does eugenics actually- eugenics doesn't work. Isn't there something about that? Isn't that why everyone, like, other than it being, you know, very, you know, Hitler-y? How can you say that about Hitler? I love Hitler and Hitler loves me! Isn't that the reason why eugenics fell out of favor? Because it doesn't really work like that. Does it work? Does eugenics work? <laughs> I can't believe I don't know this. Slightly concerned that eugenics works now. <laughs> but if you've ever seen the movie, it's no surprise the companies that paid for product placement in the film wouldn't have been thrilled. I can't believe they really paid for it because it makes them all look bad. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. For those who haven't seen the movie, you should. The basic premise is that an average man was frozen in time for a thousand years Futurama style. He woke up to discover a dystopic world run by corporations, a world where everybody was a total and complete moron thanks to generations of the wrong types of people breeding. Dobby gripped the tender balls of the boy who lived and whispered, Dobby is master now, and Cornelius Fudge gets to watch. Because of this, Luke Wilson, the movie's completely average protagonist, discovered that he was now the world's smartest man. But if the world was run by corporations, that meant there needed to be corporations throughout the movie. Corporations that didn't realize what they were signing up for when they played for product when they paid for product placements. <laughs> Isn't the one about like, oh no, there's another movie where they go to the future and there's something about tanks? This is a completely useless tangent because I just realized I don't remember anything enough of it, but there's like tanks with adverts on the side. Is that idiocracy? For example, as people got dumber and dumber, the burger chain Fodruckers changed its name to Buff. <laughs> the chain Carl's Jr. changed their slogan from Don't Bother Me, I'm Eating to <laughs> You, I'm Eating. This movie's brilliant. A representative from Carl's Jr. also appeared on television next to a politician giving a speech, and every time the politician mentioned Carl's Jr. by name, he was handed money. To their credit, Fox's lawyers seemed to have a real sense of humor about everything that was happening in the script. It really sounds like they loved the idea, and they offered some useful advice. For example, the coffee chain Starbucks had transformed into Starbucks exotic coffee for men. It's so good! And it featured offerings like full body latte and extra foam latte. I, I totally forgot how good this movie is. Foxes and how genius Mike judges. Fox's lawyers thought this might go over better if they created an entire red light district rather than picking exclusively on Starbucks. This led to judges adding in H&R Block Adult Tax Return, home of the gentleman's rebate, as well as a fictional adult chicken wing company. Needless to say, not a single company was happy with how they were being portrayed in the movie. Brondo? Oh, that was it. Not Gatorade or whatever. Is Brondo a real brand? Which is what Plants Grave was originally going to be Gatorade. However, Gatorade actually saw what was going on in the movie and were able to back out in time. Other advertisers were not so fortunate. According to Terry Crews, who played President Dwayne Elizondo Mountain, <laughs> you can match <laughs> I fucking love this. I can not want to watch this movie again. Other, I saw it like not. I've seen it a couple of times, and not even that long ago. Jesus Christ! After advertisers saw other products were being used, all these real corporations were like, "Oh, wait a minute! Wait a minute!" There were a lot of people trying to back out, but it was too late. Fox. 
did have one other race up their sleeve, however. While idiocracy could theoretically tarnish the public image of these brands, that would only be possible if people actually saw the movie. In a reported attempt to avoid lawsuits, and because they assumed all the money would be in DVD sales anyway, like it was with Office Space, Fox released the movie in as few theaters as legally possible to comply with their contracts. Is that really how it works? Is it like, oh no, only a small number of people saw it, so it's only a tiny amount of slander or whatever the f this is, allegedly. It was in like three theaters for one weekend. It was the first movie Fox ever made where they spent literally zero dollars on advertising. <laughs> It's so good, though. It's so good. And this is free advertising. Like, Fox, you spent nothing. And I hope people will go out and buy this movie. Or, you know, whatever. It's great. Jerry Maguire. Somehow, I've never actually seen Jerry Maguire. Rip. Jesus Christ, this is, it's a good movie. And this is a movie that I've seen for the first time where one of my writers hasn't seen it and actually brings it up. Yes. Daddy, chill. Even though I'm pretty sure I've seen every other football movie ever made, I didn't even realize it's about football. It's about, like, agency. The short version of the plot is that Jerry Maguire, played by Tom Cruise, as a sport agent. He got fired from a firm and decided to make his own go of it, but the only client that stuck with him was Rod Tidwell, played by Cuba Gooding Jr. Rod had been in the NFL for at least a few years at this point, and he needed to negotiate a contract for at least $10 million in order for his family to survive. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. How much do you need to survive? I don't know, $10 million? Chill, bro, chill. <laughs> you don't need that much to survive. Because the average family in the 1990s just couldn't scrape by with only $9 million. Kevin and I, same page. Or maybe because Rod was injury prone throughout his career and was going to have a lifetime of brutal medical expenses. Isn't that covered by, like, football player insurance or something? No. But because Rod had been so prone to injury, he'd never gotten one of those sweet, sweet endorsement gigs. The original plan was for Rod to start with a bitter hatred of Reebok for snubbing him throughout his career, only to finally get that sweet com contract and recognition from Reebok at the end. There was even going to be a post credit sequence showing Rod's first ever Reebok commercial. Obviously, the sneaker company loved the idea. Sure, Rod was going to talk some shit about them throughout the movie, but getting that contract was going to be one of the big emotional climaxes of the film. Cuba Gooding Jr. won an Oscar for this movie. Really? That's cool. And the Oscar goes to Cuba Gooding Jr. and Jerry Maguire. And his character's Oscar-worthy Reebok commercial was going to be the last thing moviegoers saw. I have to say, though, I mostly remember Tom Cruise from this movie. Show me the money! <laughs> Really, what's not to like? Reebok paid $1.5 million to TriStar Pictures to seal the deal, and their sneaker sales skyrocketed after the much-beloved movie came out. Times have changed, right? Shit is a lot more expensive these days. Either that, or this shit movies is underpriced. Because, I mean, I'm not getting like paid $1.5 million for a company to do an ad read, but it, I, I, and it is very far off. But it's not like... I, I know, like, big, big, like, if in a Mr. Beast video, they're going to pay him at least a million dollars for one of those sponsor spots, right? And this is, like, a Tom Cruise movie. I know it's back in the day, and inflation and shit still. Oh, wait. No, they didn't, because all of that got cut out of the movie. There was no movie-long story arc involving Reebok, no joyous commercial at the end, nothing. All that remained were three sentences, two of which were just meaningless setup. After paying $1.5 million, all Reebok got from the deal was Rod saying, wait, just I'll boil it down for you, fuck Reebok. All they do is ignore me, always have, always have. $1.5 million for that, huh? Companies may not have been thrilled with idiocracy, but at least that was a clearly satirical look at a thousand years into the future. This was one of the main characters of a movie earnestly saying, Frank Reebok, a mention they had paid $1.5 million for. Surely they're getting their money back or they're suing, because that is, like, not okay, TriStar. And you better believe that there was a lawsuit of it over it. Yes, there was. Oh, you're a lawyer? No, it just doesn't So you're a lawyer? You're a lawyer? Just trying to be helpful. Oh, Supreme Court Justice Anthony Scalia is back from the dead. Reebok sued TriStar for either $10 million or $12 million. I've seen both numbers, but the company settled, so we'll never know the results. All I can say is that TriStar's defense was that Reebok was allegedly made aware that all of the scenes they agreed to could wind up on the cutting room floor. And while the post credit commercial was cut from the movie, it did still get filmed. It appeared as a bonus feature on the DVD, which no one watches. <laughs> So, if you ever wanted to see Cooper Gooding Jr. do an over-the-top Reebok ad, it is freely available online. 
I kind of do. I might watch that after watching this. Watching this? <laughs> I'm making this video. You're watching this. Partner. <laughs> you know. <laughs> the internship. When you clicked on this video, you undoubtedly assumed it was going to be a bunch of companies getting f***ed over after paying to be in movies, but these disasters can go the other way as well. In 2006, the movie The Breakup was Vince Vaughn's debut as a script writer for a major motion picture. It's also one of the most brutally unwatchable pieces of crap that I've ever sat through. Never heard of it, never seen it, never will. The movie just feels like watching your parents fight in front of you for two hours straight, and it has absolutely no redeeming qualities. Now that probably should have been the end of Vaughn's career as a screenwriter, but he gave it a couple more attempts, including a 2013 movie, The Internship. That's the problem when you're famous, right? Because Vince Vaughn is super famous and super funny, and he'll be like, Guys, I wrote this, I wrote this movie. And people will be like, Uh-oh. <laughs> it's a bit shint shit, Vinny. And they'll make it anyway because he's Vince Vaughn. Whereas if someone, regular person, writes a movie and it's shit, never goes anywhere. Maybe they get better with time, but that first one is not getting made into a movie. This include the 2013 movie The Internship, and unlike his first go at it, this wasn't a completely terrible idea for a movie. It starred Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson as two 40-somethings that applied for an internship at Google after getting laid off from their sales positions at another company. I've seen this, but I thought it starred... What's his face? The older dude? Or is that another one? Does he go... Maybe that's a movie where he goes works as someone's assistant. Super famous old guy. I want to say Al Pacino, but it's not Al Pacino. Um, it, it doesn't matter. I've seen this movie. I don't remember anything about it. Great job. The two got accepted for internships, but they had to compete against other teams of interns, and only the winning team would be guaranteed jobs. Like any tech company in the early 2010s, Google was famous at the time for its corporate culture of ping pong, free beer, and whatever else it is to keep everybody from being productive. In theory, this could have been a comedy about the two older men trying to fit in with this culture of young, tech-savvy entrepreneurs. How do you do, fellow kids? As well, eventually using their decades of experience to teach the recent college graduates a thing or two as well. I remember before I had my own office, I I think I tried working in a co-working space literally twice. The first time I, I was like, this will be nice. I'll go work around other people. That'll be good for motivation. And I go to this co-working space. It's literally just crammed full of people who it just seemed to be trying not to work. And I'm like, this was way pre-COVID. This was like five years ago, six years ago or something. And everyone's just like trying not to work and i'm like aren't you all self-employed because otherwise you'd be in an office so doesn't it kind of matter if you're working or not and i just everyone's just fucking around making coffee having a beer going out for lunch and i'm just sitting there trying to work and people be talking to you and it's just like i'm here to work it's a co-working space if i wanted to chat i'd go to a chatting space we make party! <laughs> and then i went back one more time to see if anything was different, it was not, and then I never went back to a co-working space again. Because it's not a co-working space, it's like a co fucking around space. The overarching idea is hardly a new concept, but it could still have been entertaining in the new setting of Silicon Valley's bizarre corporate culture. Unfortunately, because the entire plot of the movie was about working at Google, they were going to need to get Google's permission. Normally, I'd expect negotiations on something like this to involve the studio pitching the movie and asking if Google wanted to pay for the product placement, making it clear that the characters could just as easily be Facebook interns. But I guess they really had their he heart set on it being Google because they didn't even ask for money. Not only did Google pay absolutely nothing for the product, placement, they would only let the studio use their name if they could agree to a minor catch. Google got creative control over anything in the movie that involved their products. That's essentially the whole f***ing movie. Google, you pulled this off. Holy sh! all of the other companies learned something. Exactly everything is the whole movie. Fox essentially handed creative control of the entire movie over to Google, and it absolutely showed. The entire movie felt like a two hour long infomercial for Google, except instead of the company paying to get their advertisement in front of viewers, the audience had to pay to come and see their ridiculous commercial. Fortunately, this was a total and complete disaster. The movie did gross $44 million, which isn't terrible. If I could create something that made that much money, I'd be pretty f***ing pumped. And Zoolander only grossed $60 million. Whoa, but really? Zoolander's f***ing incredible. Zoolander's an amazing movie. But Zoolander only cost $28 million to make, whereas the internship cost $60 million, meaning they lost $60 million on the deal. I mean, it's easy to make $50 million. Just spend $60 million. 
The movie got horrible reviews from critics and audiences were barely any kinder. Yeah, I don't remember anything about this movie, which states a lot about it, doesn't it? It's just, uh, just a nothing. The only reason it made as much money as it did is because of the star power of Vaughn and Wilson at the time, and the hopes that this might be the next Wedding Crashers. God, this is this is like a collection of amazing movies from back in the day, and less amazing movies, but all Wedding Crashers. <laughs> the ends of Wedding Crashers, where he's like, nothing hornier than funerals. <laughs> funerals are insane. The chicks are so horny, it's not even fair. Ah. <laughs> But I did refer to the movie being a disaster as fortunate, and I stand by that. While Fox obviously weren't happy about hemorrhaging money, it taught all of Hollywood a very valuable lesson. Never give creative control over to a company just so you can use their name. While Hollywood is notoriously bad at learning things, I have a feeling this sort of disaster won't be happening again anytime soon. And that's the end of today's video. Thanks for watching. I'm going to put my beautiful model back. I love this. I can't wait to watch this movie again.